right. Beautiful. Now, today's sermon is about, it's called the day in the life. All right. Now, I'm going to show you some pictures up here in a second. And these people were trained, they went to school, very special schools to do one thing. And they do this very well every day of their life. And as the picture comes up, I want you to tell me what do you think these people do every day in their life. Okay? Is that pretty easy? Yeah. All right, let's look at the first picture. All right, so would you call this fireman to come bake a cake for you? No. no. Would you call this fireman to come fix your plumbing? No. no. Would you call this fireman to come and put out a fire in your house? Yes. Yeah. That is it, right? He was trained to do one thing, and that is what? Put out fires. All right, you guys, you're doing well, right? Help people. And help people. You got it, yes. All right, next one. Policeman. All right, so would you call this policeman to come mow your yard? No. No. Would you call him to come do your laundry? No. No. Would you call him if someone was trying to hurt you? Yes. Yes, because he's there to do what? Help. To help and protect us, right? Now, does he do anything else when he's on the job? Eat donuts. <laughs> <laughs> help people. Help people. Help people. All right. Help people. Help people. Yes, 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 yes. All right. All right. Okay, we got a couple more. A couple more. All right. Who's <laughs> who, the next person? The next person. What does this person do? A doctor. A doctor. Now, a doctor does what? He helps people who are, sick. He, who are sick, right? If you have a fever or you need to have your appendix taken out or your tonsils taken out, you're going to call a, a doctor. That's what he does when he goes to work or she does, right? Every single day. What about me? I have a Exactly. All right. We have a, a couple more pictures, all right? What's this next Donuts. picture? <laughs> What's the next picture of? A black white thingy. That's coming up. What's that? Baptized? Yeah, who's being baptized? A, a young, a, a young boy. And why is he being baptized? Because he, he believes in. Jesus. He believes in Jesus. And after he gets baptized, then the next picture shows what? Um, people. People doing praying. what? Praying. praying, worshiping God, right? And then what's the next picture show? Reading the Bible. They're studying and. And there, maybe that one boy in the middle is maybe he's sharing the gospel or sharing Jesus with other children. You think so? Yeah. And so as young Christians, as you guys believe in Jesus, our one job to do is what? Um, preach to others. Preach to others, share the gospel with others. Yes, what else do Help Christians others? do? Help others. They tell them about Jesus. They tell them about Jesus. And they don't send them to the Bible. Yes. No. And we eat donuts in the morning, too. Yes, we do. All right. But a, a, a believer, a Christian, is to do one thing, and that is to tell others about Jesus. Do they do anything else? No. Not really. Donuts. All right. I'm going to share a couple of verses with you. Okay, the first verse is Mark chapter 16. Can anybody read that up for me down here? Can you read that? No, very good. Now, does that describe a Christian? Is that what we're supposed to do every day? That's it. Jesus told us to do one thing. Go and preach the good news, right? Okay, one more verse. Who wants to read this one? All right, Malaya, next verse. Is it up there? There it is. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the all the peoples. Psalms 96 3. Exactly. So we're to preach the gospel and declare the good deeds of who? Jesus. Jesus. Thank you for helping me today. You guys can go back. All right. You guys, three to five, you guys can go back to your service. All right. Almost a plan, almost, almost. All right, we're going to be in 
Acts chapter 12, as we continue on in our series in Acts, as we look at the church and, and how it began and, and how it flourished, and, and today we're going to look at, as the title is, A Day in a Life. And we're going to look at, at two people here. We're going to look at our groups of people and people. We're going to look at Peter, A Day in the Life of Peter, and we're going to look at A Day in the Life of the church, the believers that were there also uh, in, Annie, or in this, the city talking and, and sharing and, and what they did while Peter was in, in prison here. And then um, hopefully we're going to look at this maybe in a different light today and how we're going to use this for our lives and, and, and move forward today. But let's go ahead and pray before we read the first couple of verses here. Father, we do thank you for your truth and for your word. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that is here and is moving amongst us, Father, that is going to open the eyes of us and, and those who need to see you today, Father. You're going to challenge us through your word, Father. I pray that what is spoken today would just glorify and honor you. We thank you. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as, as we've been seeing, the gospel was being obedient, per, obediently proclaimed throughout the area, not only Jerusalem and Judea, but now into Samaria as it went to Antioch. And it was on the cusp of going worldwide. As, as Carl told us last week, that Antioch was kind of like the, the beginning of something major, that the gospel would be taking basically to the known world, the Roman Empire. At that time, these people thought that was it. And so it was on the cusp of that. And, and Luke gives us a day in the life of Peter and the local gathering of believers at this time in reference point of, of the church. And the glimpse gives us today some important lessons and to remember and answers to questions that we could continue in our obedience as Christ commanded us to go and make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That was the directive he gave to us, the church. Just as the verses that were read. And, and we got to remember that just like <laughs> the policeman and the fireman and the doctor, they were trained and raised and transformed in these new people to do one specific thing, that we, the church, are designed and have been raised and taught to do one specific thing, and that is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. To go and, and proclaim the deeds that God has done, the good deeds he's done and will do through his son, Jesus Christ. That is it. Peter was, was he had one mission. He had one mission, and we look at here, you know, as we see this, this, this story, could he accomplish his one mission while he was in prison? Could he do what God intended him to do? Could he be obedient and, and continue? I mean, he was obedient there, but was God done with him yet? No. He still wanted him to go out and continue doing the one thing that Jesus told him to do. And nothing was going to hinder that progress of Peter, as we will see here. And what happens when we are obedient, what happens when the church is obedient, not only do great things happen, but we also know that some bad things can happen. And let's look at this first point, that when persecution increases, or it increases when the church is obedient. And you think, well, gosh, you know, we're here at Wolf, we're obedient, how come we're not being persecuted? Maybe that time hasn't come yet. But if we continue to be obedient in the midst of a world that is against us, maybe perhaps then we will be persecuted. When it's no longer socially acceptable to go to church and we are obedient in going and, and, and doing what we're called to do, maybe perhaps then there will be some confrontation and maybe some friction, maybe some not-so-easy times ahead of the church, even here in America. We don't know that. But we do know that we see in Scripture when people were obedient, when churches were obedient, there was persecution. Let's look at these first three verses here. John, or Acts chapter 12. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of the unleavened bread. And when he had seized them, seized them, he put him to prison and delivered him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. 
intending after the Passover to bring them out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayers for him was made to God by the church. We know that throughout ages, there's been an ongoing war between the forces of God and the forces of this world. Even though the outcome is certain and will be final, Satan continues his efforts to squash, to diminish, to minimalize, to make the church unuseful. But if you look in the past, you know, the efforts were there. You think of the time of Noah, how close was Satan into accomplishing his task with Noah? It came down to how many people? Eight people, right? He was close. Everyone else had turned their backs on God. Only Noah walked with God. And his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Because of Noah, those were saved. Look at Moses, the one who was put in the cradle and was saved by the, <coughs> the murders of babies at the time because they were looking for the specific person. Moses was spared. Look at the, the, the Israelites themselves. Through the, the thousand years of time they existed and the ups and downs, at the end there was still a remnant of people who still was obedient to God and was trying to keep the covenant with God. There was a remnant there. God, Satan tried, but it was, didn't happen. Joseph and Mary and Jesus escaped off to Egypt during the persecution and the killing of the babies. <coughs> and then finally, and we can't forget, you know, the final quest or the final time or effort to, to squash God and his plan was with Jesus. He thought he did it. Satan thought he had won. But praise God, what happened on the third day? Resurrection. And so, God cannot be thwarted in his plans. We know that. But we also got to know that Satan doesn't stop. And we're going to look at this passage today and how he tried to stop what was happening and stop the growth of the church and maybe discourage it to render them useless uh, in their efforts. So what about now? We see the church here. You know, has the war ceased? Is the war over today? Is the war over so that we can come here every day and just enjoy a nice air-conditioned building and, and, and sing some songs and worship God, hear the word, <coughs> and then go off into our different homes? Is the war, is that, is this the culmination right here? Is this, is this what God intended solely just for us to come together and, 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 and shake each other's hands and, and worship in here? Is there more to the life, the day in the life of a Christian? This isn't it. This is part of it. But a day in the life of a Christian should not be just explained by us gathering together once a week. There's more to a day in the life of a Christian. Are we saying thank you to Jesus so that we can come and sing this? No. We're saying thank you, Jesus, that we have life and we are thanking him every day of our lives in this world around us. So here we have Herod, the grandson of the twisted man who, who reigned during Jesus' childhood, where Herod the Great was just plain evil. Herod the king here was just a people-pleasing nobody. He was so worried about losing favor with the people that he did whatever he could to please the people here. And then at this time, it was what? It was killing Jews. If I can kill Jews, I can keep Rome off my back. And that's what he found, and he decided, you know what, I'm going to do this. So he, he, he killed James by the sword, uh, which meant that he was trying, that James was leading other people to other gods besides Caesar the God. This is the third time that Peter was put in jail. So he saw the effects of James, and you know what, I'll kill James, then I'll get Peter, I kill him, that's going to please the people. And all the time, Herod is just a puppet of Satan trying to diminish the church and cause it to basically do nothing. I guess he was thinking that if I could take out the disciples, I can stop this foolish advancement. If I can kill all 12 disciples of Jesus, this church thing is going to cease to exist. Maybe that was it. Maybe he thought he could stop it just like he thought he could stop it by having Jesus put to death. But we forget who's in control. 
Whose plan is this anyway? Is it our plan? Is it Satan's plan? Or is it God's sovereign plan? Isn't it? And will that plan ever be stopped? No. Does he want us to be a part of that plan? Yes. To live and to worship and to be obedient to him. So the question is here, what we see on the next point. If this is his plan, the question is, how are you and we, the church, being handcuffed? Think about that. That just perhaps, maybe we've been studying Revelation too long, but perhaps this is a good analogy symbol of us, the church, that, you know, as Peter was handcuffed, Satan thinking that he can stop the progression if he just puts Peter in prison. How are we being handcuffed? Think about this. Which is more detrimental to the advancement of the church? People dying for their faith or people not being obedient to the commandments of Jesus? Which is more detrimental? A or B? Okay. Because we see that when people die, when there's martyrs and, and people are living for their faith, nothing stops that. And in fact, that kind of gives people encouragement. And people are saved because they think, who in the world would die for somebody else and, and give their life up? That must be pretty powerful. But on the other hand, when people are disobedient, things tend to spiral downward. In his book, uh, C.S. Lewis, The Screwtape Letters, there's a, a dialogue between Screwtape and his nephew, Wormwood, and he says this, a moderate religion is as good for us as no religion at all. And then he says, and more amusing. <laughs> just, just, just think about that, that thought. A moderate religion is as good as no religion, and at the same time, we can be amused by these moderate people who aren't doing what they should be doing. So by, by this quote, who are you playing to? Who are you performing for? Who are you living for to amuse Satan and, and his, his minions? Or are we living to please God? Who's your audience? What is keeping you handcuffed? What is keeping you a moderate Christian? One of my favorite terms with my students is, are you settling for mediocrity? Some people say mediocrity. I like mediocrity. Are you settling for mediocrity? Are you just moderate? Are you handcuffed? Not allowing the Holy Spirit to, to move within you and to do the great things that God has planned for you. And the question is, what is handcuffing you? We can go through a whole list of things. The things that just came to mind that, that I think we as a church do sometimes is, are we looking to be served rather than to, to serve somebody else? Are you looking to be served rather than serve somebody else? Which one are you living for? Are you more concerned about tradition rather than the souls of man? What do you hang on to more tightly? The commandment to go and, and preach the good news, or are you more concerned about what we used to do? Maybe fear is handcuffing you. Just being uncomfortable in doing this is handcuffing you. Maybe you're more worried about your preferences over the benefit of others. Maybe it's just a lack of love and compassion for others. And I think this analogy is good because as Peter was handcuffed and he was bound between these two soldiers and these legions or these groups of men, he couldn't do what he was called to do. And if we allow any of these and maybe something else that I didn't say control us, are we able to do what we're called to do? Or are we bound? And we see what happened here, this, this great story, and we're going to read it. It's such a great narrative of what happened. It goes along with the next point. Because we've got to understand that the powers of this world are no match for the power of fervent prayer. 
Everything that, that you can identify that change you to the wall or change you to something else, those chains can be broken or those fears can be overcome. That selfish type of attitude can be overcome by fervent prayer. And when you hear the word fervent, what comes to mind? What's that? Continuous. Continuous all the time. What else? Fervent. Determined. Determined. What else? Passionate and sincere. Passionate and sincere. Okay. Anything else? Fervent. Powerful. Powerful? All right. Well, let's, let's read this. This is this narrative of what happened when they prayed. So verse 5, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest or fervent prayer for him was made to God by the church. And this is what happened. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and light shone in the cell. I like this. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. It's like he was so, and that could be a whole different sermon, that Peter was so at ease and so comfortable and, and so in the will and walking with God that he could have slept anywhere. And that the, the angel with the light in the cell, angel had to give him a kick, say, Get up, Peter, let's go. I mean, just kind of picture that. Because he was okay. He was, he was not stressed. He was not worried. He had, as he wrote later in his letter, he had cast all his anxiety on who? On Jesus. It's a great message for us today that we can cast all anxiety and all worries and stress upon. He wants that. He says, give it to me. I think the, the term used that to cast is to roll upon like you're rolling a stone over. Roll that heavy big stone onto me and I will take that burden from you. All right, we'll move on before we get crazy there. He says, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so and he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Just come on, let's go. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. When they passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along the street. And immediately the angel let, left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of the Herod and from all the Jewish people who were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he had knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it is an angel. But Peter continued knocking. It's like... Do they, it's like they, they didn't believe in their prayers, right? They were praying for Peter to be released, and when he was released, they didn't have, no, that can't be true. God can't do that. Do we realize that when we pray in Jesus' name, when we pray in, in, in relation to God's kingdom and work, that he's going to answer that prayer? That if you go home tonight and pray that God give me an opportunity to share the gospel tomorrow, do you think he's going to answer that prayer? He is. But the point is, is what? We're not praying that prayer often enough. We're not praying that prayer fervently enough. And when we do pray it, expect God to answer that prayer. Or maybe you're praying that any one of these chains that are holding you back, that he will give you triumph over that, that will enable you to do what he wants you to do. If you pray that, he will answer. But sometimes we pray with, with unbelief. We pray that, we just pray because we know it's right to pray, to pray, but we don't believe it's going to actually take place. God is faithful in his prayers to him. <laughs> he continued knocking when he opened, they saw him and were amazed. 
Why were they amazed? They were praying for this. I just... But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the, to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers, go figure that, over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered them that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. We know what happened to Peter after, it's not much. We know that he died later, but Peter was used, God used him to get the church started up to this point. And not that Peter stopped ministering, but the story goes on with Paul now. But we know that Peter was faithful. We know that Peter was meant and he was called to do one thing and he couldn't do that while he was in prison. So the power of the world has no match over the power of fervent prayer. They knew that God only had the power to release Peter. Just as God only had the power to raise Tabitha. Just as God only had the power to release Peter the other two times that they prayed. Just as Jesus admonished the disciples for not praying before attempting to cast out the demon that prayer is necessary. It is necessary for us individually and it's necessary for us as a church. And they prayed fervently. And we were close to the terms, the medical term describing this of fervent is the stretching of muscle. Are you praying in a sense that you are just, you're, you're stretching yourself and you're just vigorously doing this on a consistent basis, as you said? Another time, this, actually this word is used three other times. The first time in Luke 22, 44, it says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, fervently. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Any, any wrestlers in here? Wrestling? When you wrestle, I mean, on TV, when they, on the Olympics, it looks like they're doing nothing. But when you're locked up, are you fervently restraining that person so they don't overcome you? I mean, we can't see the muscle straining, but you know that you are straining with every ounce of energy so that person does not overtake you. Are we praying against our enemy in that case? Are we straining in our prayer so that the enemy does not overtake us and chain us to something that we don't want to be chained to? That's the type of prayer that we need to do individually and the type of prayer that we as a church need to do if we're going to overcome the battles and for us to be moderate Christians. Amusing Satan because we're doing nothing. Fervent prayer. We need to be fervently praying for the chains to be broken from us. The chains of sin are gone. We know that. That death no longer has any effect over us. That we are spiritually free and set free through Jesus Christ. But are we continually be transformed in our mind because we know that our mind does a great job of what? Chaining us to something, correct? And as Paul told us in, in, in Romans 12, 1, that we need to be continually reading it and being transformed through the renewing of our mind. The soul has been renewed. The soul is perfected because of Christ. What is your mind now? What is the state of your mind? Are you renewing it? Are you allowing it to be chained to this world? If you've been baptized in this church, I know that Romans 6 has been read to you before, right? Who's been baptized in this church? All right. And what passage of scripture was read before we baptized you? Romans 6. Let's read that. It's worth reading. Turn to Romans chapter 6. First five or six verses. This is, this is who we are. All right? This is what happens when we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6. So what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in a what? Newness of life. Just like all those professionals, they have this newness and new profession. They live that out. We as believers, followers of Christ, we have a new life committed to doing what? Serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That newness, that is who we are now. For if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to what? Sin. You got, we got to understand that. And, you know, this passage should be a regular staple to remind us of who we are in Christ. A regular staple in the cupboard, the cupboard of Scripture that we feed upon. It's not like... We don't feed upon this like, like our turkey dinner once a year, where we eat it and, and enjoy it. This scripture, this type of scripture, the scripture itself, we should be consuming every single day. For me, it's peanut butter, all right? Every day. <laughs> a spoonful of peanut butter, it, it goes a long way. But we need to treat scripture like that. And passages like this that remind us who we are. And that we're no longer enslaved to sin. No longer chained, that those have been shattered, and you're free, you're empowered to live in obedience according to God's word. We are new creations. Peter was called to follow Jesus and to be fisher of men, a fisherman of men, making disciples wherever he goes. That is who he was, and he couldn't do that being chained in, in prison, could he? He was inefficient there. So God removed him. And this is who you are. You and I have been called to follow Jesus and be fishers of men, not to be chained to pride, tradition, fear, selfishness, maybe just apathy, personal preferences. Those things are to be, to be gone. That we are Christ-centered, loving Christ, loving those around us, and just humbling ourselves in that state. Putting each other first. Serving each other, like battling how we can serve each other the most. For you competitive people, how can I serve you more than you? I mean, it's kind of crazy, but that mindset. How can I serve you? Like I mentioned, the word fervent is used two other times in the New Testament. I think it's worth looking at these, and that's the, be the next point. 1 Peter 4.8 Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love conquers a multitude of sins. So we are to love fervently. Think about that. Loving fervently. The next one, Acts 26, 7, and we'll talk about these. To which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. Earnestly serving, that word. As for this hope, I am accused by the Jews, O King. Those two places, three places, the word fervent is used to describe the life of a believer. And so the fourth point, if it's up there, a great reminder of how a day in the life of a follower of Christ should be characterized. This is how and what we should be characterized by. These three things cover a lot. First one, that we are fervently praying. We, we talked about that. Does fervently praying characterize you right now? Are you straining? Are you like in a, a lock hole of prayer? If you might have Jacob, as he, as he wrestled with God, are you wrestling and praying so that Satan will not overcome you in this world. As your prayer life could be described as fervent. Are you fervently loving? Are you straining to love each other? Are you going out of your way and making things uncomfortable? Maybe readjusting your life. Maybe allowing God to interrupt you and your plans and your routine so that you can love other people. And fellowship. And get to know the person sitting next to you. Are you fervently serving? Kind of goes along with loving. Because if you love somebody, you're going to do what? 
you're going to serve them, aren't you? So if you're fervently loving somebody, then the next thing that happens, you're going to fervently serve somebody. God first. If you fervently love God and you're straining towards that love, you're going to fervently love other people. They go hand in hand. 1 Peter 4.10. Talks about this. 4, 10, and 11. He says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as, God's, as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So the more we strain to serve and love fervently, God is going to supply you and give you the ability to do that. Because that's our excuse. I can't do that. My answer is, of course you can't do that. You're trying to do that all by yourself. But God tells us here, and it's a reciprocal thing. It's like a, a, a snowball effect. The more we desire to serve fervently, the more God gifts you and gives you the ability to do that and the strength to do that. Because that characterizes who we are. And all of this needs to be done in urgency. Sometimes we, we go through life and we think, maybe not this week. Next week. Next week come, no, this, this is not a good time in life. I'm busy, schedules, what have you. Not a good time. All done with urgency. Here's a quote here by a guy named Gary Naywolf. If every Sunday is just another Sunday and you don't have a burning sense that lives and eternity hang in the balance, then you've lost the edge that all great churches, preachers, and movements share. Do we have urgency? Are we urgent in wanting our life to be characterized by this? Are we urgent in our prayers for the lost? Are we urgent in our desire to want to go out and share the good news with other people? Because the way we pray, the way we love, the way we serve will describe your urgency. Because the more urgent you are, the more fervently those three things will happen. I guarantee it. No one likes to lose a battle. Over the course of time, nations, people, they will fervently defend themselves or attack in order to win. We need to do the same thing as well. The fervency describes who we are. Because we know the next step, the enemy has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. You have been empowered to do this. You have been given the Spirit of God to give you everything you possibly need to do this, but we have to act upon that. Our, our minds need to be renewed and unchained from our past experiences in life. We have to remember that. Verses 20 through 23, the rest of the story here. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and, and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended upon the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took a seat upon the throne, and delivered an oracle to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of God, of a God, and not a man. And then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms, and he breathed his last. God will take care of those who reject him and go against him. That's guaranteed. It may not be in your lifetime. And just like the martyrs who, who prayed into the altar for God to avenge their death, God will. He will take care of those who reject him. It's not up to us to worry about that. It's not up to us to be angry with people who who don't want to accept this wonderful gift of salvation. God will avenge those people, or avenge us by judging those people. The next last point. 
God's purposes cannot be frustrated. What happened because of their prayers? What happened because of their fervency in their life and their character? Verse 24, but the word of God, what? It increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. God will continue his work. Nothing, in the, nothing shows in the past where God has ever been trumped by Satan, has there? Never. Is it going to happen in the future? No. His word will continue to flourish and to grow. But we, we want to be a part of that. It reminds me of, of Esther in, in Esther 4.14. As, as Mordecai was confronting her and, and giving her encouragement to do this hard thing by going to the king, he says this to her. He says, For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have, been, have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Our time is, all, as long as you're alive, your time is now. You are living in such a time as this. And if we don't do it, it doesn't mean that the gospel is going to stop, that there's going to be somebody else. But why not join God in his work and receive the blessing from doing what he has called us to do? We're living in such a time. His purpose for us as children it's to do with the psalm that describes in, in the passage I read in Psalm 96, 1 through 3. It should be up there. This is what we should be doing. We're singing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Each day proclaim the good news that He saves. Publish. Proclaim His glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things He does. Does that passage describe, characterize what we should be doing every day? Fervently praying, fervently serving, fervently loving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are amazing God. And Lord, we, we do thank you. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth, Lord. And Father, now as, as we go into this time of, of, of music and singing and, and collecting and offering, Father, it's because we love you. Father, we can fervently give as well to you because we love you and we love to see your gospel proclaimed here in this, in this city. Father, the truth that you came to this earth, you died for our sins, you rose again. And Lord, for those who believe in that truth and accept that wonderful gift, have life. So I pray, Lord, that we will respond today by giving of ourselves, by giving of what you have blessed us with and provided, Father, that we may see your kingdom grow today. We love you. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take offering now, and uh, this is...